is uh, yes, as I was saying. So as funny say that this will be recorded. So uh, because we want to share the video on YouTube after after the meeting. So the, we will take about an hour or so to discuss uh, the first time speaker workshop uh, the the rough agenda will be 15 minutes more or less of introduction and then uh, 45 minutes uh, with q a with a panel with the experienced speakers today we have experienced speakers we have uh, three experienced speakers valerie sebastian and rodrigo but anyone can uh, pitch in uh, for uh, giving um, suggestion so before going into that, uh, I think uh, I want to do the the I want to give the, the um, I want to pass the ball to um, Christian, who he is representing here the program team, so uh, so he can share information about uh, the logistics of a presentation happening um, during Euro Python. Sure, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, most of the details of the of the conference, I hope it's not so new to you all, like uh, being like more detail for each presentation, being around before, testing your computer beforehand, and um, always have a plan B, at least with the slides. Uh, I will be more open to maybe instead of bother, bother you like with all the, the information uh, to have more questions further on. But yeah, anyway, let's go with the, the notes that we had already gathered. So um, in each presentation, you will have a host. So we'll be the person that will be in charge of like uh, presenting you and um, helping you with setting everything up for you to start your presentation. Um, the other, I am not so sure how long the gap between the talks will be. I think that last year was five minutes and this year we wanted to push it a little bit forward, but I need to confirm that. But there is some gap between the talks because it's highly probable that the people going to your talk will like to go to a, a different one. And uh, uh, the other one is that the room names that we have here, I will not share anything, don't worry. It's just to remember the names that I have here somewhere. Um, here rooms. So there will be different rooms for the tutorials and different rooms for the talks. So depending on uh, which type of proposal you submitted, uh, for example, the, all the tutorials will happen in some rooms that will have a name uh, that start with club. So club A, B, C, D, and E, and H. And for the other speakers, it will have the forum hall, they have the terrace, the north hall, south hall. And in the main hall, which is we outside the, the, the forum hall, will be the place where we'll have like food. And also, very importantly, the poster presenters also will need to have... Um, the space there to present their posters. Uh, the setup, usually we do have a few adapters, but it's always a good advice for you to carry your own things. Assume that there will be an HDMI cable on the podium for you to connect your laptop. So if you're a Mac user, I'm sorry, you need an adapter, uh, but also in other computers as well. So even though we might have a few things around, ensure yourself that maybe you have your own thingy when the same with the clicker i know that different clickers are not uh, i mean not every single clicker works for every single person so maybe you have your own check it uh, before uh, making the suitcase for going to your python and um the other interesting thing is that um, we do have q a for the talks which is usually a very important part of the scenario because people need to discuss but since I know many of you are first-time speakers, I know this might sound scary. Not because you don't have all the answers, not because you are not a, a good um, have a good knowledge on the topic, but also being there on the spot. You know, maybe you made a typo somewhere, and someone would like to do that. We will have uh, some training with our hosts so they can moderate the questions. But if you still don't feel like getting questions, please let the host know before you start your talk 
that you will not like to take the QI, uh, Q&A uh, during the conference. So what we usually host will do is to invite everyone to approach you outside the room, maybe at a coffee break, maybe at lunchtime in case they have some, some answers. So you can always display your contact information in this last slide and they can be, uh, you can talk with them afterwards, right? So don't feel the pressure that you need to do that uh, um, uh, without any other excuse. And last but not least is that the talks will be uh, recorded. This is mainly not because we want to sell it, not to make AI from your faces, but uh, because we want to put it on the YouTube channels after some time so many other people can access them. Because as you know, even though most of you, I hope, are around uh, Europe or are able to travel to Europe, many folks follow the Europython, but they cannot afford being there. And we cannot give grants to every single person that is interested in the conference, sadly, but it's a good way for us to put this content out so everyone can learn, because after all, sharing the knowledge is the most important part of the thing. I think those are all the points that we had uh, written down. Um, ah, yeah, good point that I got here from the from Theophanis is that the tutorials will not be recorded, though, because, I mean, recording a tutorial, even if we had the capacity, would be very messy. Like, it would be there, like, for three hours, like, with random conversations sparking in different part of the rooms, that would be not uh, convenient. Yeah, I think the talks are... it's more it's more interactive uh, the tutorial bit, so it would be yeah. you know, not great to record it. Okay, th thanks Christian for this introduction. I think uh, we while we sent out this uh, invitation, we uh, we have received a few questions from from people. And I think you touched upon the um, the process before the talk, talking to the host, all these kind of things. But uh, do you know how big are the conferences rooms? Uh, do you have an idea how big yes. they are? Yes, I have them here because I never remember by memory. Um, so the smallest uh, rooms for the talks uh, are the terrace to A and to B, which are around 120, 160. Uh, full capacity. Uh, then we have the South Hall 2B and South Hall uh, 2A, which is 210. We, and also the North Hall is 210. The Forum Hall, which is the largest room where all the keynotes and the main announcement will be uh, happening, is uh, has uh, 700 um, seats. And for the tutorials, we do have uh, most of the tutorial rooms are, are around 100. And also we will have some special rooms for open spaces during the conference that I think at one it will be 100 and the other one has less capacity, like around 40. But that will be the capacity for all the the rooms. Right. And uh, any anything? So what are the process before the talk? I think uh, the suggestion is to go there uh, on time uh, before well before while, time <laughs> yes exactly before well while the previous talk is finishing so just be there uh, so as soon as the previous talk finishes you can go there talk with the host and say if you want the Q and A or these kind of things mm -hmm. uh, by your setup or these kind of things I guess it is uh, the the process before the talk and let me see anything. Mm, not really. I mean, um, I guess that I don't know if we will make public the the list of the host. But sometimes what I used to do, and maybe it's an advice for you to be more calm, is that to to try to meet the host of your session the talk before. So yeah. you go around and say, "Hey, I have the next talk. I will be around. I need to go to another talk first, or I will be out waiting for for my turn, or I will be sitting here. So don't worry about it because." The same as you, we will have some hosts that maybe are first-time hosts that will be like, where is the speaker, right? And then we will not be able to to call you on the phone. So, but uh, yeah, just be try to be there with a few minutes uh, before. And uh, the other recommendation is like, well, I mean, um, I, okay. So what I I, um, uh, I think that what is the usual recommendation is for you to always to uh, send through the system the slides of your presentation on time. I know this sometimes can be tricky, even myself of finding situations that I am needing to finish stuff before my talk. But be, be make sure to at least to share the slides uh, with uh, via pre talks. I think you can still do it um, way before the conference, so we have a backup plan because you never know what happens, and it's usually good for for you to carry your own slide, but also for us to have them 
on time because it's highly probable if you tell us like, no, we will send it after the conference, you will forget. Not because we are a bad person, because this thing happens. So, what, what, so what, when yeah. you say on time, what do you mean by that? Is a, a week before? before the presentation? So or, they can so the, before the conference. Sorry. So they before can the send, conference. Yeah, yeah, if you can upload the the slides before the conference, that will be amazing. Because as far as I know, you should still have access to edit your proposal, and there was a field for you to upload your slides. Okay. Okay, no, and actually this was one of the questions, so th thanks for that. So yes, please remember to upload your slides before the conference so we have a backup plan in case uh, things go sideways. Um, would, uh, another question that uh, we got was, uh, would there be any post-presentation debrief? Um, I don't know if in in... in... In previous year, there is such activity. Maybe this is also for you, Theophanes, but uh, I would say that if there is some interest, there could be, I guess, maybe some personalized interaction. Maybe if you are interested for something, maybe you can contact program directly. But uh, I don't know. Theophanes, this, this happened last year? Uh, I mean, to get... Uh... Sorry, could you uh, uh, what what exactly if it happened? A debrief. So you have like oh. a somehow like a meeting is a maybe assessment of what happened, how it went, and maybe getting some feedback. I guess that the person that made this comment was mainly looking for feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, uh, there are people that they are asking for feedback, and I think uh, the best way to go would be to send an email to program mm. uh, after the the event. Which is tricky as well because we will need to to have our hosts uh, around uh, the the room. Uh, we might share inform uh, feedback from the, all the talks, like in a general thing. But it is always a possibility that maybe everyone that attended your talk forgot to give feedback, so we will not have feedback, and we will need to rely on maybe the host being around. But uh, but yeah, something could be. Adjusted. I feel your advice to have a a connection like to communicate with the host this is the way to go even for the feedback because yeah. it's the person that for sure attended your talk and knows from the first second till the last how the, the talk mm -hmm. uh, went yes correct um is there any technical support during uh, or before the talk if by technical is configuring the computer, I would say yes. Usually this is just like uh, the host will be in charge of making sure that everything works with the AV team uh, close by. So we can always double check. And this is why it's so important for you to have a few minutes before your presentation. If you have before the coffee, uh, your talk is just before lunch or your coffee break, make sure to go there at least 10 minutes so you can have everything set up. Uh, most of the hosts will be able to help you with some connect connection issues. But uh, in case everything goes really badly, we can always try to improvise and maybe use a different computer for someone from the organization or volunteers that have around and try to help you with that thing. So yeah, uh, during the talk, eh, as, far, as far as I know, there are rarely issues during the presentations and uh, worst things that can happen is that somehow the signal goes bad or the cable breaks or anything. and. When this situation happened, uh, so we have the support there from the AV team. And uh, if something goes terribly, terribly wrong, we will find a solution. I have been in conference where something really breaks and it's not your fault. And we have been able to move people, for example, for the last day or adjust, maybe swap some sessions in other rooms or stuff like that. So we will find a solution, but this rarely happens. So don't, don't be too scared about it. But I guess the bottom line is that you're not by yourself. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. The <laughs> team of people ready to solve any kind of problem might be. Exactly. Uh, so I think that's uh, a good thing. So is there uh, are there any opportunities for practice practice sessions? We don't have anything uh, scheduled for that. Uh, but I will recommend you that uh, maybe you have some local meetups that have a meetup maybe soon uh, having uh, the, because even if you for example let's do we do a one-on-one -on -one now and you give me like an example of a presentation I can highlight a few points but it's not really practicing right so because you're not in the room and stuff so uh, I I know it's a we don't have a lot of time before the conference but 
check with your local meetups or maybe in your work. You can give some of your colleagues the presentation. This is something that many people do as well. Um, maybe grab them uh, after lunch or something for half an hour, give your presentation there and do some practice rounds, mainly with uh, um, uh, in per in an in-person configuration because that's way better than the, than the online approach. But yeah, we don't have anything... Uh, within the uh, the conference. I mean, you can always go around and check the room, but I don't know if that counts as, <laughs> as practice. All right, thanks a lot. I guess uh, also this, this call is part of the mentorship program. And then as in terms of practice, if you're being paired up with a, with a mentor, I guess one way to practice your uh, presentation is also doing one to one with your mentor yeah, okay it will be online it won't be like uh, on live on stage with uh, all the kind of cables and everything but at least you will have a chance to uh, practice your your presentation and related to that i also want to thank all the mentors that have been uh, helping out with the mentorship program uh, funny uh, i think this year we had quite a few mentors mentees can you share a few numbers uh, as far as I remember, we had to uh, 30, 28 uh, mentors and mentees. So it's a good number. So I think yeah. Yeah, that was uh, excellent, I guess. And I have all the questions that we had uh, from uh, from the registration. And I think now we can open up uh, to Q&A with a panel. Uh, so as I said earlier, we have a uh, few experienced speakers, uh, Barry, Sebastian, Rodrigo. I don't know if you want to introduce your quick introduction by yourself. Yeah, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm very glad that you are here. Um, and well, uh, I'm from Guatemala. I'm a data engineer, currently based in Madrid. And I have been a speaker for multiple PyCons around America and Europe, um, and a few times in order. Um, and well, so I'm very happy to, to help you. Uh, also, uh, I really encourage you to um, as as you already said, um, to try to present on the on the local chapters before to to practice. That's I think very very useful. Thanks a lot, Valerie. Next, I don't know what's the order, but I can go next. Hi, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm a Python programmer. Been using Python for over 10 years. I've been also speaking at various uh, conferences, mostly Python ones. Um, um, the first conference I ever spoke at was EuroPython in 2016. And since then, I think I presented some uh, talks at various Pythons around the world. I think I was last time I was counting, I presented at around 20 something conferences. Yep, that's me. And Rodrigo. Hey everyone, sorry I paused there. I'm I'm a very weird person, and I was thinking if I was going to make a joke or not, and I decided not to. So that's why there was a pause. Um, I'm I just do public speaking because it's fun, honestly, and I think that's enough. That's enough to understand the where I'm coming from. This is this is fun. I do it because it's fun and hopefully you'll have fun as well doing it. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction. Now you know who to ask the question to. So is there if there is any question that you want to ask to them, uh feel free to unmute yourself, ask the question away, or you can uh, drop the question in the chat. It's up to you. Could start. I've got a question. Um, yeah, go for it. Do people have any advice um, for the Q and A bit? If you get a question and you can't think of a good answer off the top of your head, hey, Rodrigo, that's easy. You just say, "Well, off the top of my head, I don't know how to answer," 
So maybe let's get back to it after. Let's meet me outside and we'll look it we'll look it up. We'll figure it out together. That's what I do. Makes sense, thank you. Anyone else wants to pitch in on this one? I'm still looking how to raise hand in Zoom. I cannot find myself. So I'm just gonna start to yeah. We can do that later. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. Okay, well that's analog. Uh, yeah, the, just to build on what Rodrigo said, uh, I totally agree that saying I don't know, it's a totally val va totally fine answer. Like It's much better to say I don't know than try to like come up with some answer that might or might not be true. Like uh, as Rodrigo said, if, you, if you're worried that oh, if you say don't, I don't know, people will think you're not um, knowledgeable in the subject, you can always say, well, I don't know, but we can talk afterwards or I can look it up and come back to you. But try to like say, I don't know, if you don't know, instead of like coming up with something. Okay, cool. Is there any other question? I have one, if I can. Yeah. Hello, I'm Peter uh, from Czech Republic. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, code uh, examples in the presentation because, you know, I'm going to present about design patterns and I would like to put there some examples, which might be 80 lines of the Python code. So I tried to make a screenshot like the, you know, these 40 lines at once, splitting it into two slides or something like that. What do you recommend for such, uh, you know, thing if I put... I should put the screenshot of the separate or just uh, have a link, let's say, to the GitHub where the code will and I will scroll down during the explanation of uh, these things, examples of the code, or should I just move on to the, let's say, Visual Studio code to show the code example directly there, uh, how you should proceed with the, you know, uh, when you're presenting some code examples. Very good question, Valerie. Yeah, so what I will recommend is to definitely share the, the GitHub link or a QR, uh, QR code uh, before you go into the code, I mean, to explain it and everything. So they can uh, search for it and, you know, and have it by hand just in case they want to look at it during the presentation. and. Uh, of course, after the presentation also. Uh, but um, sometimes what can work is to highlight the most important parts of the code. So you can have either, you know, something like a blurry background with all the lines of the code and then something really highlighted of, of the line of the code that you want to show or just present in, in one slide um that line that you want to explain and you can even explain uh, a few lines right not maybe not the 80 <laughs> lines but um but a few that are very important so you explain like uh you know the 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 core of what you are doing there so so they can understand a little bit of that and then afterwards uh they can check out the full code in github Thank you. Oh, uh, Sebastian, yes. It still doesn't recognize my hand. Oh, it does. Uh, I do what Valerie suggested to like highlight pieces of code. Uh, if you don't know how to like highlight something, people just put an arrow that works very well. Just one piece of advice, like sometimes people, I see that people add a lot of unnecessary code. So if you're like explaining specific part from those 80 lines, you can like replace a lot of other code with pseudocode. Like sometimes people will have a code example with like a function to log in the user and the whole function is written there even though you're not talking about logging the user in, you can just write a pseudocode, hey, here the user logs in, here is the important code. So we zoom out on, zoom in on this and the rest of the code just can be blurred or something. Also, I want to, Pitching on this, uh, actually, this was a good feedback uh, given from uh, Guido after PyCon US. 
So I leave that tweet on the chat, but also repeat what he said uh, in terms of accessibility of uh, the, the slides. So uh, he suggested no colorized code or black backgrounds because many people might be colorblind, so might have difficult to see colors. And also, like he said, blue on purple or gray is, or, or gray is really hard to read. And also uh, large text. So if you want, uh, if you have 40 lines of code, maybe it's not that ideal. So you need to find a way to stress the important bits, as Sebastian and Valerie said, because it's very, very hard to read the text from a screenshot of your terminal. So you need to do some extra work to make the, the, the slide a little bit more uh, readable. Uh, Rodrigo? I always have fun saying this. So the answer to all of your questions or the answer to most of the questions will be it depends, right? So everyone will give different advice because different things work for different people. So I just want to come in here and give this disclaimer early on and say, I disagree with Valerie. Uh, I don't know if the, I, I think that it's an awesome idea to have the code on GitHub for people to check later. Depending on what you're going for, it might not be a good idea to give them a QR code early on because then you will lose people and they will start scrolling on their phones and they will not pay attention to what you have to say. But both Sebastian and Valerie and I agree on, please put very little code on the screen at a time. It can be on VS Code, that's fine. It can be on the slide, it's fine, but very large font size and very little code because everything you put on the slide people will try to read it. So if you have 80 lines of code, people will try to see what's written there. They won't be able to, but they will spend time not paying attention to you and trying to read. So very large font size, as little code as possible, regardless of whether you do it on VS Code or the slide. That's my that's my take on it. Thanks, uh, thanks Rodrigo. Yeah, thanks for feedback. So um, just read out the, the question uh, that Miriam wrote on the chat. So it's, uh, you know, if the slot is 30 minutes, usually you have 25 minutes for, for the talk, five minutes for the Q&A. If your talk is 27 minutes, then you have three minutes for the Q&A. So I think we, uh, we are pretty strict in maintaining the timing because then if we start delaying uh, the uh, the talks, then uh, all the timings get messed up. And then, so I think we will be very strict in maintaining the time. And I think, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Panis and uh, Christian, the the session host will have kind of a small sign uh, saying you, you, have, you have 10 minutes left, you have five minutes left. So you will be uh, seeing how, much, how many minutes you have left. Yeah, this is also a super good idea. Sometimes also, I know that some people get nervous when they put they see a sign of five minutes and say, oh my God, I have like half of my talk. So something, uh, going back to the recommendations and setup, what I usually use to have my phone with a timer next to my, comp my laptop. So I'm all the time in control of the time. So if you can do that, if you have the, um, you can concentrate on looking at the time passing and not get too nervous, I also will recommend that. And also another thing is to practice, practice and time yourself home, time yourself with your with your presentation, stick to the 25 minutes or whatever minutes you want to stick it and then practice and practice to hit that target and then you will be fine basically. And another, like I agree with Christian and another thing I want to add is that uh, if you feel nervous, for example, if you can uh, always remember to look at like to look to the host because they are there to, to help you. At least this is, this is my advice as a host. Rodrigo? Can I give some unsolicited piece of advice? Brilliant. So, and again, this is what works for me. It might work for some of you. It's my, my personal opinion on the subject. But to help fight nervousness or anxiousness and to help prepare for the time slot, make sure that you know and by knowing, I mean, make sure that you understand what you want to talk about 
and not necessarily memorize every single word that you want to say. Because if at some point you get so nervous that you, you skip a bit, or if you miss a sentence, if you just have, if you've practiced 10 times and you know the main topics and the order they come in, then just because you skip the beat, nothing's going to happen. It's going to be fine because you know that after talking about A, you're going to be talking about B and C roughly in that order and roughly about those ideas. And if you script your talk, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll find a, a terrible example of this. If you have everything scripted and if you miss a word, it's going to be the end of the world because it's scripted and you expect the, the words in that order. And then if you forget something, everything's going to be screwed for you. And it can be quite difficult to, to recover from that. So what I do personally is I make sure that I know the ideas I want to talk about and the order I care about them. And then when I practice, I just practice the ordering. And every time I give a talk, either by practicing or on stage, it's, it's always different. I always use different words. And the order of the sentences and the ideas usually comes it comes in different orders, right? Because I didn't memorize the order or the the order of the very specific sentences, only of the major ideas. And so because that, that gives you more flexibility, it also helps you be less nervous because you know that you have some leeway to do things your way. And it's fine if you forget one thing because no one will notice. So that gives you, I think that gives you some some freedom. And I like it for myself. Sebastian? I found a shortcut for raising the hand. Uh, two two things. I initially wanted to say one thing, but now I have to say something about what Rodrigo said. Uh, I like scripting. Like my talks are scripted. I write full scripts. I don't go by the script when I do the presentation, but if I like blank out, get stressed, forget something, I can always like fall back and like read for a moment from my speaker notes. And that's what has been working for me for years. So. We are three experienced speakers here and apparently everyone has their own idea. So there is no like silver bullet. Uh, so that was one thing. And just to circle back to the timing. Um, so regarding the timing, I like to remember, let's say like two, three key moments in my presentation. And when I'm rehearsing, I try to remember where, where should I be in the time at this moment? For example, let's say I'm talking about three main things in my presentation. So then I remember that I should be on minute 12 after the first part, on minute 16 after the second, on minute 20 after the third. Um, so I don't have to remember the whole timeline for my presentation. I just need to know, for example, like the most key part for me is to know where I should be before I go into the summary. So I know if I should speed up or not. And the reason why timing is important is because if you go too slow, the, um, uh, the organizers will cut you because there is another uh, talk after you. But if you like get stressed and you go too fast, then I notice that some people, they will be like skipping points and like skipping some slides. And then you suddenly end up 10 minutes too early and you basically skip some important things. You wasted some time preparing a presentation that you didn't talk about. So like try to not be too slow, but also try not to be too fast. That was a long advice. That's it. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. So, yes, Vale, uh, go on. Yep. Uh, just to add, because I I think I agree on on most parts of uh, of both Rodrigo and Sebastian. Um, but also what I usually do is that I structure my talk like if I have a schedule like more specific sp schedule and I know uh, something like how many minutes I want to spend on each of the topics like in general not so specific but something like okay this is the introduction like how I'm gonna explain the context of what I'm gonna talk about um, I'm going to spend, let's say, five minutes. Then the core of uh, what I'm going to talk about, like uh, samples or or something like that, um, it's going to be, let's say, 10 minutes. 
and five minutes for for the conclusions and and for um some extra topics and finally um like uh, going into the into the end of of the talk like going back on what we learn or something like that uh so it's overall is it's it's more like uh, in general this structure but that uh, helped me out uh like uh, rodrigo said um if i skip something in in some moment it's it's okay because i can uh come back to mention it later um but i know that it has to be around the time that i uh i have structured it in my head right like i check just a few times the 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 time in my in my laptop uh so i can see okay i'm around the time if not then i have to speed up a little bit or i have to slow down and i have more time to explain a little bit further what i'm uh exposing that's all thanks a lot my I, I think this was this was one of uh one of the questions actually you kind of anticipated us how to structure a, pre a presentation effectively. I don't know if uh, Sebastian Rodrigo wants to share more on on the structure of the presentation on top of what Valerie said. Uh, I... Anyway, uh, Sebastian. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to add like in terms of how you should structure your presentation. I noticed that there are like two approaches. There might be more, but two that I noticed that some people will do what they were taught in school. So they will start with like introduction to the topic, then where they say, oh, this is what I'm gonna talk to you about. Then they talk about the actual topic and then they close it with, this is what we talked about. And like some people say, this is boring because well, you were taught about it in school. But for me, this also this is a nice thing because you repeat cr uh, crucial points multiple times. And if you want people to remember what you talk about, it's important to repeat things. And the other approach that I see some people take is that it's more like a storytelling. So you don't tell the agenda. You just like if you have a story where you say, OK, I have this problem. This is how I solved it. But then there was another problem. That's how I solved it. This is more entertaining. So it's a different approach here. It doesn't make sense to like do the introduction and do the, well, summary is still important, but here you're not going to like foreshadow what you're going to talk about because you still want to tell a nice story and have some elements of surprise. So neither of those ways are the best. It's just two different ways of telling your story. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Uh, Rodrigo, do you want to add anything else on top on this question? That's fine. So, uh, and actually, uh, there is yet yeah, another question: is how someone can keep the pace of the talk retaining attention of the audience. So, I think this one of their concern when uh, someone uh, uh, kind of deliver a, pre a presentation. Uh, Rodrigo. Well. If you want to keep their attention, you don't want to lose their attention and you will lose their attention if you do not modulate your voice. So if you if you're mono monochordic, I think that's the English word, right? If you always talk in the same cadence and with the same tone and if there's no if it's just flat, then it's going to be boring and people will just start falling asleep. Um, other things that other things that lose their attention is. If. <laughs> And I feel like everyone says this. Everyone here will nod their heads in agree in agreement, but then everyone does it wrong. Large font size, little text, only bullet points. There's always people with huge sentences, huge paragraphs on their slides. Everything that's on your slide, everything, the logo in the corner, your email in the corner, the text, in there people will read the text and people okay sorry let's not generalize i can only do one thing at a time so if i'm reading i'm not listening to you and i'm sure most people are like me so if 
so that's a, a sure way of losing people's attention. Then people have these slides with walls of text and I'll try to read it. I won't have time. You'll skip to the next slide and then I will be annoyed because I don't know what was in the slide and I also didn't listen to you because I was trying to read. So that's terrible. Large font size, please speak like a normal person so your voice should do things because that's how voices work. Sorry, I just these are the technical terms, you know, do things with your voice. And then one thing that I think is very important is be enjoy yourself. If you're having fun, it's much more likely that the uh, for the audience to enjoy themselves. If you're having if you're generally enjoying what you're doing, it's it's more likely that the audience will also enjoy listening to you. And then you can add a couple of things to that. You can add interactions with the audience. You can ask questions. You can ask them to shout the answer to a question you already know the answer to. All right. Sometimes I ask stupid questions. I just ask what's depending on the context, but something like what's two plus two? Because uh, because in the context, I'm typing two plus two and then I wait for them to answer and everyone's going to answer four. But they get to interact with you. Ask them to raise their hands if you have, I don't know, if you want to know how many how many of you have already used the scripters, show of hands, and then they raise their hands. Try to make jokes. If they work, they work. If they don't work, that's fine. I love it when my jokes don't work because then everyone's looking at me as a poor Rodrigo and I say, don't worry, guys, I know I'm not funny. So there's plenty of things you can do to engage the audience. Thanks, Rodrigo. Valerie? Yeah, um, I think uh, what Rodrigo advises is, is uh, pretty uh, much in the in the point. I will just add that uh, when I started uh, speaking at, at conferences, uh, somebody, I, I don't remember who, <laughs> uh, many, uh, maybe many people knows this, but if you don't, well, Maybe this is good for you too. Um, somebody recommended me that I should have one idea or one concept, just one, per slide. Meaning, if we have, let's say, bullet points with few texts, like uh, like Tora Diego said, uh, it's it's better to have the less text as possible. But still, if you have something like bullet points, then go for just one bullet point by slide. Or if you want to show, uh, let's say, images, uh, visualizations, statistics, whatever, uh, then go for them one per slide. Like if it is one idea, then uh, use just one slide so they can follow it like pretty Pretty much easy. Thanks a lot, Valerie. Sebastian? I need to add a counterpoint to what Rodrigo said. Like, uh, many people here will be first time speakers and they might not be, they might not feel comfortable asking questions and making jokes. And like, I don't interact with audience that much. Like sometimes I might ask a question. Sometimes if I have a joke prepared, I might tell it, but I usually don't. So I think it's fine if you want to like crack some jokes, but you have you have to be prepared that they might not land and you have to just move on not to like get distracted with that. Uh, one thing about like alternating the, uh, modulating the pace of your voice is that something that is much easier to do is to actually uh, alternate the pace of your slides. So if you have like a five slides with code, maybe next slide should be like a picture or like some GIF or something like that. So sometimes you can have a slide with like header or like a part of the slide that is a picture. So if you don't have the same type of slide over and over again, that's also a nice way to keep people interested because uh, slides you prepare in advance. So it's easier to like plan how you're going to prepare different slides. While if you're on the page, you get nervous. Maybe it's kind of hard to come up with a joke on the fly. Uh, one last thing that I noted down is that um, be prepared that no matter what you do, people will be bored. People will be looking at their phones. Uh, people will be yawning, especially if it's after lunch or before lunch. Um, so if you 
I, once I had a, someone who was sitting right in front of me and was yawning all the time. It was distracting, but just like look at someone else, focus on someone who's paying attention. It wasn't the worst. Um, a friend of mine was telling me a story that he had a guy in the front row who just fell asleep during his talk. Uh, later on, it turned out that um, the talk was in Polish and the guy was in uh, was only speaking English because he was the next speaker. So he couldn't understand anything. So that's why he fell asleep. But yeah, things like that happen. Just don't worry about it and focus on delivering your message. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Um... So, and then um, I think, uh, yes, jokes have been mentioned. So also bear in mind that uh, what is a joke to you might be uh, less a joke to all other people, the culture. So I think the, uh, jokes are a double-edged uh, uh, sword. So yes, be careful. And uh, I have another question, uh, which is about demos or live coding. Uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Sebastian? I love this one because there's mm -hmm. always someone asking for live demos. And I always say, like, do you really need a live demo? Like, I have seen some amazing live demos and they were really worth it. And I have seen some demos that should have been a slide because I don't know, half of the time was spent showing how do you pip install something on, or things like that. So if you want to do a live demo, I think Rodrigo uh, can have a lot of tips uh, on that. I usually don't do live demos. Um, I usually try to think like, if I want to present something, um, you, as Rodrigo said, you cannot like type and talk at the same time. So maybe sometimes it's better to have like an animation on the slide of what's happening and then you can explain what's going on. But in terms of like live demos tips, I will leave it to the rest. Just a follow up on this one. So at PyCon, I've seen a talk, a presentation. There was someone with a video recording the demo, and during the demo, actually, uh, the audience uh, uh, clapped their hands. So, so it, they were applauding. So actually, they stopped the speaker talking throughout the demo. So he had to rewait to start again and then keep talking. So he said, "I wasn't prepared for the clapping." at this point, so he kind of lost the plot while he was spe uh, uh, explaining the demo. So even with videos, you need to be careful. <laughs> so Rodrigo? I was I was expecting someone to say, don't do live demos. Um, I did the cross. I was here. Like, ah, OK, exactly, because there's <laughs> because the general consensus is don't do live demos. And I just say, I mean, why not? <laughs> so Sebastian's point is very valid. So let's not, I can't tell you if you should do a live demo, but I do I do some live coding. I, I, I try to do live coding whenever possible because I like to live dangerously. But if you're going to do this, then there's a couple of things you need to do. So you need to have some form of backup. When I'm doing a live code demo, I need to know that I can show the code or the results that I care about. I need to I need to know they're there, either by having a backup slide or by having a video where we go through the process, if the process is the important thing. If the process isn't important, then maybe you shouldn't do a live demo. So Sebastian's got a point there. I mean, people don't want to look you type, to, to look at you type if what you're typing or the process you're going through doesn't matter. So make sure that it's if it's relevant, make sure that there's a backup. And the more things you, even something that we might take for granted, the in, an internet connection, that might be, this might sound like a, a, a silly thing to say, but I was, last month, I was in a conference in Germany and the internet, the internet connection sucked. So if I relied on the internet connection for my talk, I would have been doomed, all right? So the more things you need to do for your live demo to work, the more dangerous it's it's going to become. And so be prepared for that and be prepared to have a backup plan and rehearse the demo a bunch of times because you'll get it wrong. I, I'm saying that I like to do live coding. I'm telling you that I do it all the time and I make mistakes all the time during the live coding. 
but it's it's for the for the things that I do it actually tends to work out okay so it's going to depend on your situation but uh, be prepared to to fail and to have a backup if if push if push comes to shove but it's great fun because high risk high reward so it can be really it can be really amazing yes i agree i agree with, uh, with everyone um so is there any question that you might want to ask at this point And the uh, question to Sebastian. <clears throat> I think that uh, you, Sebastian, talked about that your presentation is usually scripted and you reading the speaker notes and so on. So you usually, when you're presenting, staying behind the laptop and have the view to the speaker notes or, uh, you know, uh, you are staying outside of your computer, just, you know, looking at the slides, speaking to the audience and have the clicker in your head to move to the next slides and stuff like that. Or uh, if I understand correctly, you s usually stay behind the laptop, right? To have the view to the... It, it depends. Um, so usually, the, because I, I write the speaker notes because it's so much more comfortable for me to just sit down and type everything, as I would say. I just I could just sit down and just type the whole presentation in one sitting, that's not a problem. And then it depends how many times I rehearse it. Because like the more I rehearse it, the more I remember it. So if I'm giving the presentation for the first time, I might stick behind my computer because I might need to look at my speaker notes more often. And I also have some tricks, like I put some keywords in the speaker notes in bold or in like large letters so I can easily see them from all the other text written there. But as I give the presentation, as I rehearse it more time, and if I give this presentation many more times, uh, then I use my speaker notes less. So if I'm giving the same presentation for the fourth, fifth time, I might just like walk around the stage because I more or less remember it. So at this point, the speaker notes become just a backup if I forget something and I memorize it more. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So I think so far we've been giving lots of different advices on how to uh, be, uh, how to prepare at, at our best the presentation. But the, the one of the question is, I'm I'm still nervous. What can I do? So how how should I prepare in order not to be nervous while I'm kind of delivering the the presentation, Christian? So I just want to share something that in my my company, not many people is into public speaking, so they hire a public speaking coach. So what I am telling you is not what I use, but what I heard and people tell me that works. So most of the time when people get nervous, um, <clears throat> they spend quite a lot of time before the presentation still. And the moment they go there, you know, heart rates start to go up. And then that's why all the nervousism and movement and whatever and shakiness you know, started. So this person was... Uh, advising for you to to move before your presentation. I, I understand you will not start jumping just before because it will be like the weird presenter. But maybe if you are coming from another place, just do a little sprint, you know, like, uh, you know, try to make your, your body at like, okay, we're moving, moving now and stuff. So do not stay for half an hour before your presentation, sitting in a bench, waiting and trying to memorize some stuff. You want to see. move around and make your, your body comfortable. Just wanted to share that with you. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Valerie? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, being nervous is, is normal. I just wanted to mention that uh, first. Um, but we can even use those uh, nervousness in order to kind of um, breathe and and try to to um to go slow that I, for me uh at least uh going actually slower than what i usually talk uh works um so if i see that the time is running out or you know it's going mm, faster than what my my um 
speaking is is going uh then i go a little bit faster but uh it's uh, usually um you go faster you know when when you get nervous you go faster and so fast that you end up <laughs> earlier so going slow uh, can work and then uh, i wanted to share uh one experience that happened to me and i was in PyCon us uh, so the Congress Center, uh, where this was happening, it was very, very huge. Um, and I went to the green room, to the preparation room for speakers uh, early enough, but my host wasn't there at that moment. Uh, you know, things happen and this person uh, was late to, to pick me up. Um, and I didn't know where was actually my room, the, the room that, that I'm, I was going to speak in. And it's, it was in the other side of the building, basically. So we had to literally run to the place. Uh, and, and you can imagine. I also, I have to say, this was my first time speaking in English. I'm not a native English speaker. Um, so this was everything, everything in, uh, in top of my head and running to the room. So, um, so to avoid this experience that I had, <laughs> uh, I will say, go to the room that you are going to speak in. So you recognize the place, uh, get to know where is it, uh, when you go there, I think uh, the Congress center in Prague is not so big. Uh, at least the part where we are going to be presenting. So so it's going to be okay. You don't have to run. Um, but go early to the to the preparation room. So so you are calm the last like the, the last few minutes before before speaking. Uh, you can breathe, you know, and, and be calm and arrive home to the to the um to the place where you're gonna make your your talk, yeah. Thanks a lot, Mari. Uh, Rodrigo. I'm not in, I'm not sure if this is relevant or not, but I've given a, a few dozen talks and I still get nervous. So it's not a matter of not being nervous; it's just a matter of managing the nerves and the stress. All right. Thanks. So also, um, I think when you're nervous, your ma your mouth your is is very dry. But don't worry, because there will be a, a bottle of water waiting for you over there. So you can also sip while you're presenting. You can take your time. So uh, I think this helps as well. Right. So we are on the top of the hour. Um, un uh, unless we have any extra question from the audience uh, I'll give you a few more seconds if you want to ask the last question Rodrigo super quick remark regarding Q&A yeah. if you if you get a if someone asks a, a if someone is acting like a douchebag and asks you a silly question or makes a snarky remark, if you feel like it's a douchebag question, the audience also understood that it's a douchebag question. So it's okay to politely say that you're not going to answer or that you're just say something and feel free to handle it with uh, with however however you feel like it. But if, if it's a douchebag question for you, the audience also understood. So... Don't be afraid of just saying, yeah, well, I, I'm not going to answer that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any other final remarks from Sebastian and Valerie? Or anyone else? Try to have fun. I mean, after all, it's a show. Uh, you know, you're being there, meeting people, made mistakes. It's all part of the process. I, I have not never met a person that has always given good presentations and always meet people that struggle a little bit. So 
try to have fun, right? It's a, it's a good experience, right? To say, oh, I made a mistake. I explained this wrongly. Try to mm, have good memories out of maybe the silly mistake you will make and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yes, correct. Uh, Fanny's? It's not a remark. Uh, I know that we're uh, close to uh, to end the, the meeting. I would just say a big thanks to, to everyone that uh, helped with the program. Uh, to you, Diego, to Christian, to Na, to Maria, Sebastian, to Rodrigo, and uh, to Valerie. Uh, it was very nice, and it was very nice seeing so many people interested. And of course, as Christian said, if you have any questions about the program or whatever for the conference, please shoot us an email at uh, program at europython.eu, and we will take care of it. All right, thanks a lot, Fanny's. Uh, yes, uh, I think we we done. So good luck, everyone, for your presentations. And as Christian said, remember to have fun and, and then enjoy the conference as well. This is the most important thing. Thanks a lot, and have a nice rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. See you soon. I should stop the recording.